My name is Dominikus Miller. I'm going to moderate um, this panel today. I'm a journalist and editor at Freeze.de magazine from Berlin. And maybe I'll quickly introduce the other panelists. Um, this is Dirk Powell. He's um, the collection curator here at the SMAC. And he's with uh, the museum for uh, quite a while now. And he was also involved in um, the 1984 uh, exhibition, Inshallah, that Michael Bute did here uh, in uh, Ghent, too. And um, I hope that Dirk do can tell us a bit about this exhibition during our talk. Then next to him is um, Marcel Odebach, an artist from um, Cologne, and I think also like a professor at the uh, Kunstakademie Düsseldorf since 2010. And um, is that right? Yeah. yeah. That's what Wikipedia <laughs> says, at least. So. <laughs> um, Marcel uh, is a longtime friend, uh, was a longtime friend of uh, Michael Bute, and used to live together with. Um, Michael Bute and the actor Udo Kier in uh, Köln Ostheim during the 80s, I think, right? And, um, and the 90s. And the 90s too? Yeah, no, of you course, still, until, you still live my, there. Uh, until, yeah. until Michael died. Okay. okay. Yeah. And I'm still living there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we have that right now. And this is uh, Martin Germann, um, senior curator here at the SMAC and uh, the curator of the Bute exhibition. Together here. with Dirk. Together with Dirk. And um, the exhibition is the second uh, station of a free part retrospective. First one was in the Kunstmuseum Luzern, opening last end of last year. And the next station will be uh, in the Haus der Kunst in Munich, opening in, I think, like mid-July, beginning July. Yeah, third of July, exactly. So maybe we get right into it and um, yeah, we try to here kind of like hope that we can kind of like tackle a lot of subjects concerning the work and the artist Michael Bute, who for me is um, one of the most interesting artists and his oeuvre, one of the most interesting oeuvres um, coming out of like Germany in the second half of the 20th century. But I still think it's um, considerably underrated in a way. It's still not really fitting in the canon somehow. And yeah, maybe we can also talk about that a bit later. It's also very kind of like complex work for me. It seems very easy and accessible at the first place, and then it's very, very kind of like opaque and sort of like mis somehow hysterical too, in a way for me. So I don't know, maybe we kind of like tackle all these on the way, and um, maybe get right into it and start with like the actual exhibition here in the house, and maybe Martin can tell us a bit about how, um, how you approached this oeuvre, an oeuvre which is kind of like as procedural and open as that one of Michael Bute, um, more than like 20 years after his death, and also like a, over as vast as it is and as complex and like diverse even too for an exhibition like that. Well, first of all, it's of course a co collaborate, collaboration also with the Kunstmuseum Luzern. And um, so together we were putting, um, let's say, a body of work together to exhibit. And then is of course the question with an artist like Michael Bute, how to exhibit that? because. Uh, the artist is not there anymore. And uh, I think uh, in the oeuvre of Bute, the, the presence of the person uh, played f a particular role, which might be also one of the reasons that he, and especially yeah, he as a, as a person, also disappeared after he passed away a little bit from the scenery. Huh? And it's, it's the same with someone like, let's say, I would not say that they work similarly, but Schlingensief, uh, or uh, th th that's, you might compare that. So the question is actually how to exhibit a work which is very, very closely related to the person doing that. And uh, whereas our colleagues in Luzern decided for a thematical presentation, it means they had, they had themes such as Bute and Africa, Bute and the Sun, uh, we decided uh, to follow the artist actually in, in the way we put the exhibition together. And following the artist means basically uh, to follow him in time, more or less. Uh, follow him in time means that the retrospective show we made, in fact, uh, shows his, starts with his very earliest works, when he uh, uh, participated in When Attitudes Become Form and uh, Documenta 5, and that it ends, in fact, with the last piece he made for Documenta with Jan Hut also. And uh, that in the meantime, you can see how this cosmos of Bute is actually embracing itself, how he forms his language, 
Um, then there were also some, I think, quite important additions in our version of the exhibition, which are namely Buddhist diaries, um, which we show actually a vast selection of those diaries, which are in a way a retrospective in the retrospective. And then another work, maybe we can speak more in detail later about that, but thanks to the estate we could get that and we are so happy about it. And that's the cupboard of Michael Buter. I don't know if you saw, if you all saw that exhibition, but this cupboard, which was never declared as an artwork by Michael Buter, but it was some kind of, yeah, it was always there and it's some kind of mythical machine which stands uh, for his practice. So, yeah, and, uh, but, but that was, basically our, our way to approach that, huh? to, to, to try to really to follow him and also not to, um, in the installation, not to go, let's say, that wild, as I think it was done sometimes before in exhibitions that it was tr tried out to, to simulate his way to install. But um, uh, yeah, we didn't do that. We tried to be a little bit sober because I think if, you, if you're sober in the presentation, the work can yeah, you can see the work a little bit better, so to speak. Just like to, 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 to um, come in here as, um, for example, it's also like Bute worked a lot in kind of like environments too and yeah. kind of like dragged on pieces from one environment to the next and they got rearranged and the kind of like the whole work is pretty fluid. So that was also part of the question for me, kind of like you decided obviously in the exhibition to, uh, to not try to stage anything like that, but to kind of like take single pieces, but not even kind of like go there and try to create that, right? Yeah, it was. It starts actually with, let's say, more or less singular pieces, which were created in a moment of time, and then at some point, the, his idea of sculpture becomes nomadic, uh, and we try to show that. And I think to show how something becomes nomadic, you, you need to use a time axis on which you can show that actually. Mm. So, how it, how so it gains traction, yes. basically. And because these environments, uh, maybe not everyone knows that they are not really. In beginning from the early 70s, Bute started to work in environments and only parts of those environments were declared by him as kind of autonomous artworks. And um, uh, so only they remained. So I think in the Ghent exhibition there were a lot of those. Uh, yeah, sure. In, in the beginning I remember we set the show we make with Bute. Maybe we try to do something like he did before. For, for the we had the idea, the basic idea, let's try to do something. But in the end we said, no, it's not possible. We cannot yeah. do it. It's, it's really it's outrageous to even try to do it. So we skipped the whole idea of making installations or uh, putting works together that, uh, like he used to do it. So how was it, how was it back then in uh, 84 when Bute was, I think, like, around here again for quite a while to install the show and actually also like, work on the show here and create yeah, pieces Jan, here? Yeah, Jan asked here, him to right? make a show like uh, three years before. Okay. So at a certain point, Jan said to us, yeah, I have a wonderful artist. We all have to go there and see the studio because he's making a works of art, especially for the show. And the studio is like the, has a bit of the, the, the sizes of the rooms in the museum. So we went all to Cologne and we visited him. And this was immediately a, a wonderful experience because he was so generous and Jan and him were kind of really in love. You know, Jan was in love with his artist and Michael was in love with Jan because of his like, you know, Latin <laughs> look and stuff like that. So we saw him working there. He was actually working there already on the show. We saw already parts of the Tauf Capella. Mm -hmm. So and, that started um, in Cologne. And it started in Cologne. And, and, and then he came to Ghent uh, a year later. And with a lot of works, a lot of works. It was like a big transport. Everything was unpacked. And then he started. He, was, he really w knew what he was doing, exactly. He started putting up there a drawing. There he put up clothes on the ceiling. And, and he started like mingling all of these things together into one installation. And in the beginning, it was like, wow, he's, he's putting everything together. But after a while, we started realizing that all of these works were from different periods. And this was not one installation, but these were different works he put to make an installation. Afterwards, he took them off and they went back to the, the owner of the work. So for us, it was kind of um, something special. We never witnessed before this way of working and this practice of using works to make an installation, using existing works. Yeah, we knew like uh, Mario Mertz came and he made an installation with things we bought for him and that was but Michael made it with his own works that he created before they, already. They so material for yeah, the exhibition. Yeah. And then we saw that these works were appearing in other installations in a different context. And so, so this practice was quite unique. 
And I, I don't know if any artist did it afterwards. I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah. So like for myself, maybe um, you, you know Michael for such a long time and we're really close with him. How is that kind of like, in more general terms, like then kind of like on the back of what we just talked about, the kind of like the, the really kind of like the way he brought in his own person uh, into the work. How was, how was in your experience, um, Michael's relationship between, if you may say, something like art and life no, I mean, well, well, what is interesting because uh, when Michael did the show here, um, I was here too. And, yeah. uh, and I'm mentioning this because that was very typical for the 70s and also for the 80s of Michael, that he was not coming to install a show with objects, he was coming to install the show with his whole family in a certain point. So at the end, um, I think th that was something very important for him and that was something also was, was al always kind of like uh, interested me was that Michael was a person who could, I, when I do art or I do my artworks, I have to be my myself. Mm -hmm. And Michael was somebody who always loved to be surrounded by people. And then when, when there were a lot of visitors, for example, at the Gilberstrasse or in Ostheim or here, for example, then you were immediately becoming part of the show or of the piece. Because then he said, for example, what you can say kind of like, why you're not lying on this canvas? And then he made like a portrait. And then if you, it was kind of like, oh, give me your trousers or give me this and stuff like this. And then it was becoming part of the piece and stuff like this. So for me, it was interesting now to see the show without Michel, yeah. and um, also what you mentioned without, without being part of an environment, and I think it was um, very, I was very impressed how the show worked in a very good and different way mm. than how I saw it like over 20 years ago. So like maybe maybe the word sober what you also used is a pretty good way to install it then. Yeah, there was of course there's also this one uh, moment when this installation Taufkapelle, uh, which is in our collection, we we installed it on a pedestal like f little wooden floor which has exactly the dimension of the room on the museum on the opposite where the museum was at that time, and so actually what we do is to to transform a um, kind of a spatial installation back into a sculpture somehow, which is also a question, of course, because how can you deal as a museum with, with this process-based art, which kind of, yeah, was, was made for a moment. Yeah? It was not made to be restored forever. I think that was even a part of, uh, that, was, that was very important for Michael to play with this, yeah, to play with this notion of eternity and actually to dissolve it somehow, or eternity, but with these museal uh, values. Yeah, but maybe it was also the time. I mean, in the 70s, nobody thought so much about like which material I, I can use, which can survive the next 500 years and stuff like this. Because the, I, also when you did performances, I mean, p performances or video and all this kind of like media starting to be part of the art scene in the early 70s, nobody even thought or reflected the idea what is happening with the videotape or with the photography or stuff like this. And in the same way, nobody thought how a feather, for example, will keep the color for the next 200 years. I mean, it's, it, it, it's part of also from the 70s that artists, more or less, a lot of artists gave a shit about this question. And this was also questioning the whole art system and the whole market and the value and stuff like this. And this is maybe also part of like how Michael worked in a certain way because his life and the performing act of this action when he realize the painting or a sculpture was part of the artwork. Yep, kind of like just to quickly come back to what he said before that he was always like basically also traveling with a kind of like scene around him or like a family as you call it. it yet still it wasn't kind of like a collaborative approach in a way, right? It was always very much him in the center as the artist there. Or how do you relate these two to each other? Yeah, I mean, Michael was, uh, I think, incredible egocentric. On one hand, um, I think he, but on the other hand, super generous. 
I mean, he never kind of like, I don't know if he even, I mean, living in the same house, um, I don't know if he ever visited my studio uh, in 15 years. But what he did is interesting wise, is um, he was generous in giving you pieces when you were being part of, 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 of a period or stuff like this. Then, of course, he, he loved to cook. So we went there for lunch and dinner and stuff like this. And in the meanwhile, he did artworks. And then also when I, I, I remember, um, he was always pushing you as an artist too, without really knowing what you're doing. Because I remember a year later, I had already a show here yeah, too. Yeah. So this was definitely because of Michel because of him, said to yeah. Jan Wood, you have to show him because he's a great artist. You know, so it's, 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 um, that was Michael in a certain way. There's a, a nice story about this generosity, is that when the show was on, Jan Hood said, this Taufkapelle, I want this for the museum. This is really made for the museum and I want to buy it. And they, they, they said, okay, the price, they discussed the price. And then Jan said, okay, I'll come with the money somewhere next week or something to Cologne. And then Jan raised the money, cash, and he went to, to visit the studio, and he said, here, Michael, here's the money for, for yeah, the Tau Capella. Yeah, there was cash time. And then, <laughs> yeah, it was cash time at the time. And Michael was sitting there with a lot of uh, artists and young friends and everybody around, and immediately he took the money and he started giving. You, you need money, I think. And then he gave money. And to this one artist, he said, like, what, you have this work you made, I want to buy it. And they immediately started spreading the money to everybody that was in the room. So this was, Jan was like, whoa, <laughs> it's amazing. So he was really generous. Also when he worked here, it was always like, pff, nothing was, we went all out and he was always paying for drinks and everything, so. But he was in the center, of course, like you said. Yeah, no, I mean, it was also, I mean, it was his choice when he had to leave the Gilbert, famous Gilbertstraße, I'm calling it the famous Gilbertstraße. Yeah, first, uh, first, um, studio and like, Apartment. It was yeah, not the first one, but like uh, Hannelore knows this yeah, better because okay, there was one before. But he had this like two, three apartments built together in a certain way, and then he did like '76 when I went with him to Florence to the Villa Romana. He changed the muse uh, his house into a museum, Museum Eschnaton. So, but afterwards, I think '83 it was Hannelore, isn't it? So the, he had to leave the building because somebody so, uh, bought the house and stuff like this. And then he moved into Ostheim, which one was completely different situation, which one was outside of the city in this time, surrounded by a huge garden. And it was more or less like, call it like a factory style building, brick stone from the 19th century. And then in these buildings, there were certain parts becoming free too. And he wanted, so he said, why you are not coming to Ostheim and will move into the house too. And he said the same to Udo. So he was really kind of like, ha had this idea of getting friends into the same building. I mean, we never lived together. Everybody had his own part in the building, but he was the one who wanted to have his friends or whatever surrounding him. So they are probably also then an essential part of the work itself, the friends. Could yeah, I would say, say. yeah, yeah. I, I, of, of course, because I mean, you can see this also in, 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 in the pieces, yeah. because there's certain, I mean, when I saw certain pieces, I immediately could name the person who was on the piece or who is kind of like portrayed on the piece. And for example, all the, the silhouettes drawn. Exactly. You're always kind of like seeing the works, yeah. Exactly, and Michel also traveled all the time with people together. I mean, when we went to uh, um, Florence, for example, um, to be there, um, I mean, we kind of like, it took us like four days from Cologne to Florence, and we had to stop every like four or five hours. And there were the kind of friends, Karl Heinz Scherer, and then there was another person, another person, and then sometimes we collecting other people and stuff like that. It was a bit like the caravana. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't it, I think it's kind of interesting the way you kind of like talk about that, like you basically uh, go on a, on a travel or on a caravana and collect people on the way. If you look at the, the work too, it's also about like not only collecting people, but also collecting things, like lying around on the side of the street or something like that. There's a lot of, there's a really kind of like a assemblage or collage aspect to that work 
in a very broadest sense up to kind of like the social part of it, in a way, I feel. So, um, yeah, and there was kind of like, sorry to interrupt you, but what I'm just thinking now, there was a completely different relationship to time and timing, mm. which one for us today is really kind of like very weird to think about it because coming back to this travel 76 to, to Florence, um, I said because I was still being a student and I was still kind of like being dependent on my parents and stuff like this. So I said to my parents, I'm going now with Michel Bute to Italy for a couple of months and stuff like this. And I said, bye. And then Michel was ill, he had a flu. So then, of course, we stayed for two weeks waiting for leaving to Florence. And then the whole travel took us like four days. So at the end, we arrived there like three and a half weeks later than supposed to be there. And this day it's, it's incredible to think about stuff like this. And, and, and I think it was kind of like, also, I don't know if the show in Ghent was uh, postponed the date of the opening. Or no, no, everything okay. was uh, on time. <laughs> <laughs> but it took several weeks, of course. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, what I was just like trying to, to come to is also the cupboard uh, Martin uh, mentioned earlier. Because it also, at least the way I understood it, it's also, it's a kind of like a, it's a big storage, in a way, for things, for photographs, for little kind of like ephemeralia he found somewhere. They go into the cupboard, and I don't know if I'm wrong about that, but I also always had that feeling that they also can be taken out of the cupboard again and maybe kind of like wander into an artwork or something like this, or is this wrong? I mean, what I found very interesting is yesterday evening when we spoke about uh, uh, the cupboard that you said about the last time we saw the cupboard in, in Michael's living room, it looked completely different. It, it looked really different. And then, then I thought, yeah, of course, it had to look different. Because it's, it's part of this cupboard is that it always looks different if it's, uh, if it's installed by someone. And uh, also a lot of people asked us, and how did you basically then install this cupboard? Uh, and I think it was just, we had a crate for each, uh, for each shelf. Sh shelf. And then our installation team did it. And I think that in a way, this uh, way to install is totally in the thinking of, of, of Michael Bute, because uh, um, the, the work is not kind of, let's say, there's not such a high level of control. In, or, or let's say he knows exactly where in his work control is and where he can let go, which is extremely interesting to see. And at, at, especially at such a moment when someone like, um, if a boys, for example, would really, would, each millimeter of the work would be kind of have to define. He, he really lets go also into the social, I would. I would. The cupboard was also there in 84. It was, was there already? Yeah, it was in 84. It was in one of the rooms. Mm. And so I had a photograph, and this was a photograph we, we could base on to do it now, but it's, it was so different. There were so many different items, and some were not there anymore. Other ones were new. So. We're kind of a base, to be, but it's changed a lot during the years. But the question is actually, is, is this now an artwork or not? Now that the artist is not there anymore? Yeah, for me it's of course an artwork. I mean, it's not done as that is an artwork, but I mean, it's, it's, um, I would say it was, always, uh, it was always there, and it was always uh, the heart of everything, of his I practice. would say, Hannelore, isn't it? Because that was kind of like, because what was fascinating me as kind of like as a, as a young teenager starting to become an artist because coming out of a kind of like bourgeois family background, so there was furniture and clothes and stuff like this. This were values and you shouldn't touch them. Mm. And when I met Michael, he had tons of objects, which one were very kind of like valuable for him. But when he was in his like creative period, it doesn't matter what it was, everything could become part of an art piece. Furniture, clothes, his shoes, uh, trousers, everything. But the only thing which one was always there was this cupboard, which one he never touched kind of like, and so it was in a certain way like the time capsules of Warhol, for example. But it has also the cupboard, there's one uh, thing on the outside, and that's actually a hand, huh? a golden hand, which is kind of going over the two doors, so which <laughs> made, maybe suggests that it could be, could be a, a piece Indeed. in the very end. <laughs> I mean, but the, 
there we are with that kind of like with the question of where does the artwork start and where does the sort of like the life of an artist kind of like play in or not and exactly that is kind of like if the cupboard is right on the on the on the border basically yeah way. and this is and exactly is a border i think which Bute was always also searching up mm -hmm. this the, exactly this border because this is of course a way to leave a western idea of what what art actually is and where where, where it interferes with life and actually this is the of course the dream of the avant-garde to melt art and life into something but nevertheless uh, Bute found kind of a completely different lighter and lighter way than, for example, boys, uh, one could say, who highly influenced him, I guess. Huh? Yeah, I, I think know. so too. Yeah, yeah. I definitely. How, how so, was yeah. it then in Cologne at that time? Was boys playing a role? Yeah, of course. Boys was the big hero for me. Of and 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 of course, boys was the German artist in this time. Um, but I know also. I I remember once that boys visited Ostheim. And I saw boys in the garden of <laughs> uh, But I mean, I would say that they respected each other a lot because they were included in a lot of group shows. I mean, boys was already a, 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 a much older generation than I was. So for, for me, he was, I, I was always a bit scared about him because um, I don't know why, but he was this kind of like uh, figure and father figure in a certain way. And I don't know how Michael, I think they respected each other a lot, but they were never friends. When we're, when we're, when we're there talking about boys already, something I'm, I mean, something that's really particular about that work too is this kind of like fascination and his interest in uh, Northern African and Middle Eastern cultures that, to my knowledge, at this time was pretty, pretty like exclusive in Germany in a way, the way Michael did it. And if we talk about boys, kind of like something I'm interested in too, and that is like, boys is a really German artist in a way. I yeah, feel East Germany. <laughs> in a way, how much, maybe also a question to Dirk, uh, as the only non-German <laughs> on, the, on the panel here, how much would you say kind of like, is there anything kind of like pretty like German about Michael in a way? In a kind of like, you know, from a, because I only know him from a German discussion in a way too, you know? Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure this is German. Probably this is a German. I mean, also way. in a kind of like in this really kind of like fascination and kind of like this this kind of like uh, idea of like going out, going somewhere else in a way, and then kind of like in a way thinking, even if it doesn't look like that, thinking really uh, systematic in a broader level and kind of like in systems in a way, and then as Mike, uh, as uh, Martin said before, but knew exactly where to let go too in the system as opposed to someone like Boyce or a completely different figure, Reinhard Mucha maybe, or something like that, yeah. Yeah, but Jan had a fascination for both, eh? for Boyce and for Bute. And this is, this is the thing, it's not about it, that it's German or not German, I think it's the, the fact that it's like artists, uh, the kind of artists that Jan loved, it's artists who their life and their art is one thing, they're mingled, it's like this individual mythology that has been uh, said like it is. And it's that that Jan fascinated. And of course, Mar uh, Michael was a German artist, of course, but he, he was also the shaman, like Bhutta was, but yeah. Bhutta was it more in a, like a, a serious, in a down-to-earth way, yeah. while Michael was more like <laughs> trying to fly and go to the sun and to the color. But there's a similar, and, there's a similar kind there's of like idea behind it. a similarity, definitely, it, yeah. 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 Just like going totally different directions, mm -hmm. maybe, yeah. You just have to see the colors. One was using yeah. brown and gray, and the other one was gold and red. <laughs> so and it's kind of, yeah. No, but it's yeah. an interesting, sorry to kind of like, but it's an interesting question if Michael was a German artist, what does it mean to be a German artist? But I think, of course, Michael was very influenced mm. by Germany after the Second That's World War. kind of like what I was hinting, hinting exactly. to, you know. It's and not that I would German say this, especially, especially like being in Cologne or coming, I'm studying in Kassel and then being in Cologne, both cities were, were incredible destroyed, yeah. gray, and very kind of like fucked up in this time. And I think so this might be also an idea of creating your own cosmos, what Michael did or his own world and, and, and in a different way. So and he, he kind of like, he found it in, in kind of like a fascination for like a Northern African, Islamic and Middle Eastern cultures and 
Yeah, so I think that's also be, be, because Germany was before very close-minded. I mean, in first first of all, in the in, in the time of the Second World War, then the 50s and 60s were super kind of like a close-minded still in Germany and 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 uh, gray and kind of. Uh, um, yeah, not very open, still very influenced by this kind of like fascistic ideas and, and things like this. So for, 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 for this generation to travel the first time again mm -hmm. and to see different cultures and to be open-minded also in a different way than other countries because other countries, they had a very much more... Um, kind of like different relationship because of colonies and exactly, stuff like that's this also than Germany. Yeah. So, so, so as a German you were much more maybe also naive and freer in a time of going to Africa than for example French or, or Belgium or whatever country. Would you say that there was some naivete in, in Michael's approach to this? Sorry, countries? what? There was some naivete in Michael's uh, no, it's, it's not naive, it's not especially just, just something from Michael, it's something of, 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 of maybe being German, yeah. because there was a certain <laughs> kind of like, the parents' generation never could travel. You know what I mean? There was never this experience mm -hmm. like the like like a generation before, which one could travel to different cultures and, and, no, and different no, countries and stuff no like that. Visible colonial history. There is a German colonial history, but yeah, it's not visible. But which in, one exactly? Which, visible in a German exactly. everyday culture in a post war setup. Exactly. Yeah. But on the other hand, uh, also, I think in the 70s, these, uh, Bhutto worked a lot with these carnivalesque elements. Yeah. And uh, a lot, uh, often if it's, it's spoken about his work, uh, words are used such as opulence or kitsch or as baroque. But I think they are totally misleading because of the reason that, that all this, let's say, carnivalesque element also had a certain function to create an own space in this climate. So it actually had a political function. And this is, of course, totally underestimated if one just said, haha, this is the paradise bird artist, because this is exactly not the case, or let's say these aesthetic strategies had a function. And this is often overseen. So in, in, the, in that sense, I find Wute quite interesting because the work is so full of risks. It's totally not on the safe side, which, uh, and it's totally not to kind of catch somehow. And that makes it especially, or, or for, for me in a way, very interesting eh? that he's also, that he's, and he's aware about these risks. Yeah. That's also interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I also thought that for me, my approach to, to him, that this was one of the key aspects, in retrospect at least, that kind of like made up my fascination about it, that you can never actually tell on which level things are approached in here, how, how earnest things are, yet how light and slightly yes. ironic they are too, how kind of like spiritually loaded these sometimes are and kind of like really earnestly believing in an idea of like healing something, yet kind of like jokingly, cheekingly making fun of that too again. It's really kind of like, it's really vague in a very, very uh, conscious way, I feel. Apart from the fact that words such as spirituality and mystic, they were not so, let's say, contaminated as they are today often. So they really, these, these uh, elements had another function, I guess. And it was also, I mean, I think, could one say that Bute and this circle with you also could be seen as forerunners of this generation, uh, uh, Cologne generation of people such as Kai Althoff, uh, who also, where this friendship aspect also plays a certain role, but completely different, or is that misleading? No, maybe, I never thought about this, yeah. but I mean, it's, 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 it's maybe not something which one was invented in this time, which one was always existing. Mm. And um, when you see Munich or Berlin or, or, or other scenes even before the Second World War, but um, no, but there was, I mean, it would be because the, the um, maybe it had also something to do with the whole art scene in this time. Because, I mean, Cologne was the most important city, I would say, especially in Germany and in Europe, maybe for, for, for contemporary art in the early 70s. And there were a lot of galleries. I mean, the, 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 the art fair was in, in, invented in the 60s in Cologne and stuff like this. But the um, art scene was definitely dominated by minimal art from the United States. So as a German, a little bit like different thinking, um, creative person, 
um, you had to create your own kind of like surrounding and your own kind of like niche of surviving. And that was maybe also the reason why Cologne was creating their own kind of like art scene. That was maybe the reason also at the end Gerhard Richter and Polke moved to Cologne. Uh, and, and not they moved to Berlin or not they moved to Hamburg or, 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 or they stayed in Düsseldorf because Cologne was, there's always this two stupid things in Cologne which one goes on my nerves these days but which one were very important in the 70s. This is the Catholic Church and the Carnival. And the idea of in Cologne you could do what you wanted to do. And this was definitely very attractive as an younger or as a, a, an artist who was not so much being part in this time of the official American um, art world. Yeah. But it's also something also maybe for, again from kind of like speaking from my fascination uh, or like my, my approach to it, there was something that initially kind of like really interested me that from my perspective, from a retrospective perspective of like being born after that all went down, I kind of like learned a Western German art history through Cologne or the Rhineland with like kind of like a uh, 60s conceptual minimalist scene that was very much influenced by, by the States, as he said. Plus then a certain kind of like still ongoing narrative setting in, in the early 80s with like uh, the new expressionist painting and stuff like this and then going on through the 90s kind of like playing very much on the kind of like friends thing of yeah. on the social scene aspect of things. And for me, kind of like someone like Bute comes out of a blind spot between these two kind of like points, exactly from like a 70s kind of like approach that I thought was really interesting. It was never, it hasn't had a place in my kind of like art history from, from, from my perspective when I first learned about it. That was pretty interesting to me. Mm. Okay. But also a lot of artists, I mean, I, I, I don't know, you know this better, I don't know when Michael moved to Cologne. Because, I mean, Ricke was before in Kassel, and, and then Ricke moved to Cologne because there were this, like, um, collectors, Vorwinkel, and they, um, they went to United States and they saw the gallery house in Manhattan, and they, they uh, had the same idea of doing it in Cologne at the Lindenstraße. So Ricke moved to Cologne and, I mean, you had a lot of galleries like Zwirna and so on and so on. They moved then to Cologne and with them also the artist moved then to Cologne. Because Michael showed before at Ricke, so when Ricke moved to Cologne, Michael also moved to Cologne. Yeah, yeah. So maybe a question that still kind of like interests me a lot is like why, why this work seems to be so hard to kind of like, uh, like, how to say that, kind of like put into a certain kind of like art historical canon or something like that. It is, that's also one of the really interesting facts. I think he was like, Michael Buter was like really, really well known at the time. He was like taking part in like four documentaries. He was part of an attitude to become form. Yet when I learned about him, he seemed to be completely forgotten yet he's not an outsider artist or something like that too. He's kind of like always there, but always not there too. There's a really weird kind of like border situation, I think, for him. What you guys think is this kind of like, where does this come from? Or what's the specific about the work, about the oeuvre that makes it so hard to kind of like put it into some sort of like canonical history? I'm kind of happy that it isn't in a way because that makes it interesting, but it's really, it's a kind of like, it's a tricky question, I know, but that's, that it was always searching up these breakpoints. I think we had that a bit before, that it's very risky on particular parts. Also his late work, the late work of Michael Bute, which is, let's say, inviting for misunderstandings, so to speak. Actually, it's very precise if you look what he did, because what he did in, in his late work was to revisit art history and covering all these religious formats such as the crossway with the 14 panels or the triptych as a, as a, yeah, as a highly religious format to make, to make pictures actually with his own idiom. And he did that as in, in his late work with an extremely high self-confidence. And that's also, I think, when our, when our, um, our colleagues, who, who, when we built up the exhibition and we saw this triptych, we first thought so, Ooh, what is that? Because it was the first work which was unwrapped and everyone was a little bit so, ooh, this is getting, uh. but um, <laughs> Yeah, it looks like, it, like Michael went really like <laughs> over yep. the top and really crazy. <laughs> but like he knew exactly what he did because... Yeah, it's um, very accurate and it's... Yeah. Really, uh, yeah. 
And so, so I think that, that the canon was always, what I want to say is that the canon was always part of his, of his practice, but somehow ex negativo. Yeah. And that's a little bit where he, I don't know, that where, where, he, where he plays plays with somehow, and that makes it difficult to get. And also that there's a certain, there's a certain moment when he, in the 90s also kind of, I mean, it was a bit kind of, a, it has parts of an Icarus story also, no? The, the story of Bute. <laughs> In which way? What you're talking? Yeah, about. because it, it when from the beginning when he was 24 he participated in in uh, in, in, in yeah in, in extremely important exhibitions and uh, he he hardly had these low periods or where where he was a bit under recognized or yeah I mean it's 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 it's, it's I mean there are two points what 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 we mentioned before is kind of like um, in the art world, everybody is kind of like scared about artists. Uh, they're not alive anymore and they're kind of like famous for their kind of like um, installations and stuff like this because it, that's exactly why I said this at the beginning. I was very surprised to see a lot of works which one I know from the studio or from other shows being kind of like presented here the first time in a completely different way, and they still work, but yeah. you had to prove this first, and you need maybe also some time to forget kind of like, how you needed a certain kind of like distance, mm. I think so. And then, I mean, it's not only a brutal problem, it's, 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 it's a problem of more or less every artist, that there's an up and down, and up and down, and up and down. And you have to learn, it's much more difficult when you have an up very early and then you have a down in the mid-age career because you have to survive this time and then you get rediscovered. You have, you have a lot of artists, because I just said this last week, somewhere else, for example, when I, in the 70s and 80s, there was Janis Cornelis, was definitely the artist who was having a single show in every museum in the world. And these days, you don't even see anything anymore from him, more or less, and kind of like, but there is, of course, a new generation, he will discover him again. And it's very hard for mo most of the artists, but um, of course, it, it's also a problem for more or less every artist. Yeah. What did she say is kind of like something, if you say kind of like the new generation of artists maybe discovering him, what would be the thing to take away from someone like Michael Bute for like nowadays, for like younger artists working now? Open, open hard, question. Maybe, maybe you can tell a little bit about, uh, 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 at the Kunstakademie in Düsseldorf, is Bute some kind of a uh, imago for, for what does he stand there? No, well, I mean, it's kind of like there is uh, Stefan Kürten, for example, who is now uh, teaching at the academy, and he was one of the favorite students of Michael. I know this. So there's already a, a, a generation who learned at Michael's, be, uh, being a part of his class. They're teaching now. But, but um, yeah, of course, there is... Um, I was very surprised that... Uh, a lot of younger people coming from a completely different background, like for example my assistant who is coming from Thüringen, from, from uh, um, um, ex-East Germany, who is now 30, who told me five years ago his biggest hero is Michael Bute, and I said, how comes that you know him? And stuff like that. So there is a certain kind of like information and he's still kind of like being part of, of a lot of um, young artist generation at the moment and much more than from the in the 90s because the whole style changed you have a completely different kind of like way of working again i mean in the 90s and in the 2000 there was video and medias and social pieces very important so of course there were kind of like people were more related to Baldessari or whatever, or, or, or other people. And now these days, people are be, be, be becoming interested in different themes again. And also, especially maybe someone like Bute, because the work is so physical. Um, it's the, when, when would make, one could say that what for Polke was the Rasta, was maybe for Bute the dots. 
And <laughs> all these dots were always made with the hand and always, it, it's a very physical art. And of course this or has... Stars. Or, st or stars. Later stars, stars and dots. <laughs> and I think this physicality has for, um, this is at least something we discover here that a lot of uh, uh, yeah, people also from the art academy and yeah, come and for this. them it looks incredibly f not only fresh because you don't know from which time this work in fact comes. Okay, in the beginning about those works you clearly see that, 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 that there was a program but later it, the work becomes more free and then you really don't know from when that should come which in fact uh, uh, indicates a certain and this work is, word is of course also a bit contaminated but a freedom uh, which Michel probably took himself when he was doing this work, and this is a, uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe this is something where artists therapy. naturally search therapy for. Therapy too, I hmm? would say. Therapy, in a certain therapy. way. Yeah, and no, I mean, it's kind of like, yeah, this. No, I think in, in 84, the, the show was really an eye-opener for yeah. a lot of people. Everybody who saw it was like, whoa, what is this? We never saw something like this before. And I think now, with the show we have now for students and young artists, I think the, the way it can appeal to them is the big freedom, like Michael had, in doing anything he wanted. He, 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 there was no limits for him. He did what he pleased, what he liked to do. And I think this is like a sort of could be something to help young artists to do it well. I don't have to be like <coughs> stretched in, but I can be free and, and do what I want. But that's, that's also, you said that uh, at, the, at the bottom of his idea of art, this subjectivity, which every one of us probably has, uh, uh, and he, he, he uh, wants that people put it in their work. And uh, in a way, I think a, a certain attraction of Bute might also come from that point that, uh, that the art, that's the art world is always... Uh, but sometimes I have the feeling that we are in, the, in a period of re-academization. That, that there's really young artists are just fulfilling um, curator's needs or programmatic needs. And then, of course, someone like him comes quite, uh, uh, comes quite elegant because he was just uh, uh, navigating all around that and actually don't, didn't, doesn't care about, about that. Yeah, but, but maybe also what is important for a lot of... Uh, because what was unusual also in the time for Michael because when I was kind of like in the 70s the art world was still kind of like really defined by drawers where you had to put yourself in so you had to decide do you want to do painting or I was always the video artist you know I mean I did drawings for my whole life and collages but I was always the video artist so Michael was really teaching me that you can do what you want to do. It doesn't matter what it is, because it's, you're still an artist and it's still your own work. And that is maybe something which one I think a lot of younger generation people like. Mm -hmm. Like for example, you already started with Kai Althoff. So this, this new generation doesn't want to define their kind of like style anymore so much into drawing, performing. So these days, I mean, I see this in my own class, which one is a, a named video and film class. I have from 40 students, maybe five, they do video, the rest of the people doing something else. Or they do a video once a year and they do painting and they do this and stuff like this. So that is something which one is very popular again. And that is something why Michael is definitely a figure which one was a father figure for opening up this kind of like academic structure.